This is physical chemistry, part four, statistical thermodynamics, chapter thirty, the Boltzmann distribution, section thirty point one, microstates and configurations. Here's one numerical example: If we give three energy quanta, three epsilon, two three molecules A, B, and C, there are ten possible microstates. And three possible configurations. So first, let's look at the ten microstates. There are ten rows here. Each row corresponds to one microstate. So the first microstate is this: molecules A, B, and C each receive one energy quantum. The second microstate: molecule A receives. Two energy quanta. Molecule B gets one. Molecule C gets nothing. Or we can have A gets two, B gets nothing, and C gets one. Or molecules A, B, and C can get one, two, and zero. Zero, two, one. One, zero, two. Zero, one, two. Three zero zero, zero three zero, or zero zero three. So there are ten rows. Each row corresponds to one microstate, but there are only three configurations. The yellow one, this is one configuration. The green ones, that's only one configuration, associated with six different microstates. And finally, the red ones. All three red microstates belong to the same configuration. Now, why is that? When we are talking about configurations, we're not distinguishing A, B, and C. So, really, between row two and row seven, in this six rows, what we see is one molecule gets two energy quanta. Another molecule gets one. The third molecule gets zero, so we can use this statement for each of the six rows. Now, if you look at rows eight, nine, and ten, you just need to say, well, one molecule gets three energy quanta, the other two molecules get nothing. So that's a configuration. So, if you look at this table, there are ten rows that correspond to ten microstates, but Now look at the color. There are three different colors: the yellow color, the green color, and the red color correspond to the three possible configurations.、Uh, why is this important? Let's assume a molecule dissociates when it absorbs three or more quanta of energy. And then here's the question: What's the probability of finding a molecule dissociates in the above system? So now in this system you have three molecules, and you give three energy quanta to these three molecules, and I would say, well, three out of ten microstates, you have one molecule with enough energy to dissociate. Therefore, there is thirty percent chance of observing one of the three molecules dissociate. So it's related to chemical reactions, and also more realistically, you can imagine if we give one more energy quanta to one more molecules, and then here's the question: If a molecule dissociates when it absorbs three or more quanta of energy, and then、uh, let's calculate the expectation number of molecules that will dissociate. So again, this is related to chemical reactions. Now I'm going to summarize the strategy here.、Uh, we need to count the total number of microstates and the number of microstates in which a molecule absorbs three quanta of energy. Okay, again, assuming this molecule can dissociate when it absorbs three or more quanta of energy. All right, and then we assume there's ten 
microstates all have the same probability, that is 10%, then the probability of finding a molecule dissociate is 30%. So 3 out of 10 microstates will lead to the dissociation of one molecule. It could be molecule A or B or C, it doesn't matter. Section 30.1.1, .1, counting microstates and weight. If n particles occupy various energy levels, and then the total number of microstates, W, can be calculated using this equation. n is the number of particles, a1 is the number of particles in energy level 1, a2 is the number of particles in energy level 2, a3 is the number of particles in energy level 3. So the sum of a1, a2, a3, etc. is equal to n. And then we can put this together, we can use this product sign, it's the product of a1 factorial, a2 factorial, a3 factorial on the bottom. So what's the physical meaning of this? So n factorial is the number of ways of arranging n particles when they are distinguishable. And then if we put A1 molecules in energy level 1, well, the number of permutations of this A1 molecules does not matter, right? So we need to divide this n factorial by this A1 factorial. So again, if ABC occupy energy level 1, or you may say BCA, you may say ACB, you may say BAC, or CAB, or CBA. So all six permutations of these three molecules, A, B, and C, does not really matter. So that's why we need to divide this n factorial by A1 factorial. Now if A2 molecules occupy the second energy level, and then we will further divide this n factorial by A2 factorial because again, uh, the A2 factorial permutations of this A2 molecules in energy level 2 correspond to just the same state. So that's why this is the expression of the total number of microstates. When we uh, populate all these energy levels with n particles. Section 30.1.2, the dominant configuration is the configuration with the largest weight. Or you can say the dominant configuration is the configuration with the largest associated with the largest number of microstates. So really we can just maximize this W with respect to A1, A2, A3 to get the dominant configuration. So now let's study an isolated system with a constant number of particles and a constant uh, total energy E. So this N is a constant, this E is constant. Uh, this is a so-called microcanonical ensemble in statistical thermodynamics. Now let's maximize this. To maximize this W, which is n factorial over the product of a1 factorial, a2 factorial, a3 factorial, etc. We need to take two constraints into account. The first constraint is this, the sum of ai is n. So a1 plus a2 plus a3, etc. is equal to n. This is one of the two constraints. The second constraint is this, the total energy has to be E, so the sum of AI epsilon I is E. So this AI is the number of particles in energy level I. Epsilon I is the energy of this ith energy level. So AI times epsilon I gives us the energy contributed from the AI particles in the ith energy level. So now let's maximize this W. To maximize W, we can also choose 
to maximize the logarithm of w. If the logarithm of w is maximized, then w is maximized. So we're log uh, maximized is ln w or ln n factorial over the product of ai factorial. So it can also be written as the logarithm of n factorial minus the sum of the logarithm of ai factorial. Now we're going to use the method of Lagrangian multipliers. We define a Lagrangian L. So L is LNW minus alpha times the first constraint minus beta times the second constraint. So this method is used to optimize a function, in this case LNW, under one or more constraints. In this case, we have two constraints. One is this, the sum of ai minus n is zero. The sum of ai epsilon minus e is zero. So by including this term and this term here, each multiplied by a parameter, alpha and beta, we included the constraint in this Lagrangian. So now we're going to write out this Lagrangian uh, L is ln n factorial minus the sum of ln ai factorial minus alpha times the first constraint minus beta times the second constraint. So again, this is always equal to zero. This is also equal to zero. Therefore, when we maximize this L simultaneously, we maximize this W. So again, regardless of the values of alpha and beta, as long as we maximize L, we maximize W. So how do we maximize L? Uh, we simply just set DL over DA1 to 0, DL over DA2 to 0, etc. This is how we uh, minimize or maximize a function. And over here, again, there are two constraints. Now let's try to evaluate dl over da1. l is really complicated, so this is l on top, dl on top, da1 on the bottom. But fortunately, this n, the total number of particles, and e, the total energy, are independent of a1. So what we can do is first, we can get rid of this term. This is independent of a1. This n is independent of a1. This E is independent of A1. So we eliminated, eliminated 1, 2, 3, 3 terms. Now we have 3 more terms. But over here, we can further simplify those infinite series. Because only A1 depends on A1. A2 does not depend on A1. A3 does not depend on A1. So really, uh, among this infinite number of terms, only the logarithm of A1 factorial depends on A1. And over here, only alpha times A1 depends on A1. Among this infinite number of terms, only beta times A1 epsilon 1 depends on A1. So now we have just these three terms. They are the first term of this three infinite series, respectively. So I just copied uh, the equation here, uh, except this A1 factorial is replaced with A1 times the logarithm of A1 minus A1. Uh, this is Stirling's approximation. And then we can derive this. It's pretty simple. Uh, you need to apply the product rule here. The first derivative of A1 times the logarithm of a1 is simply the logarithm of a1 plus a1 times 1 over a1. So the first derivative of this term is the logarithm of a1 plus 1. And then over here you need to minus 1. So in the end, this part is simply the logarithm of a1. So this is the expression of dl over da1. 
and because we need to maximize L. So this has to be zero. This derivative has to be zero. Therefore, we have this equation. This is zero. And then we rearrange the equation. A1 is simply e to the power of negative alpha times e to the power of negative beta epsilon 1. Similarly, A2 is e to the power of negative alpha times e to the power of negative beta e epsilon 2, etc. And then we get AI and AJ. So these two are just more general expressions. And then we take the ratio between AI and AJ. So AI over AJ is equal to e to the power of negative beta epsilon i over e to the power of negative beta epsilon j. Uh, this is the so-called Boltzmann distribution, very important. Uh, experimentally, uh, we can look at the number of populations in different energy levels. So it's possible to determine the value of beta experimentally. Uh, it's found that uh, beta times temperature is constant. And the reciprocal of beta times temperature is found to be the Boltzmann constant, K sub b. K sub b is uh, the ideal gas constant divided by the Avogadro constant. The value of K sub b is 1.38065 times 10 to the power of negative 23 joule per Kelvin. So again, beta times T is found to uh, be the reciprocal of uh, the Boltzmann constant, and beta can be expressed as 1 over kVT. So again, we have this so-called Boltzmann distribution, uh, the number of molecules in energy level I, divided by the number of molecules in energy level J is equal to e to the power of negative epsilon I over kBT divided by e to the power of negative epsilon J over kBT. All right, so this is the famous Boltzmann distribution. Now let's look at one numerical uh, example. Let's consider a, a large collection of 900,000 particles they occupy three energy levels, uh, 0, epsilon, and 2 epsilon. Let's say the total available energy is uh, 400,000 epsilon. That means this 900,000 particles here, 400,000 epsilon energy. And epsilon is one energy quantum, so it cannot be divided. So that means, well, some molecules will have zero energy, for sure. Some others will have uh, in energy of epsilon, and uh, the remaining molecules will have an energy of 2 epsilon. So now we have this equation, N1 plus N2 plus N3 is equal to 900,000. N1 is the number of particles in energy level 1, N2 is the number of particles in energy level 2. And this is the energy expression. So N1 particles have each have an energy of epsilon, and this and three particles each has an energy of two epsilon. So together we have 400,000 epsilon. Uh, this N1 molecules have zero energy. So using this equation, we know N1 is 900,000 minus N2 minus N3, and then we can use this equation to find that N2 is 400,000 minus 2 and 3. Basically, you just divide both sides by epsilon, you get this equation. And also, we can express N1 in terms of N3 only by replacing N2 with 400,000 minus 2 N3 here. And then we know N1 is 500,000 plus N3. Now, our goal is to maximize this W. Again, N is the total number of particles, N1, N3, N3 and N2 and N3 are the number of particles in these three energy levels. So how do we maximize this? Well, very simple. We'll just maximize the natural logarithm of the number of microstates, L and W. It's this. And then to maximize L and W, we just need to take its first derivative and set the first derivative to zero. Therefore, we have this equation. This is 0, 
Well, because the first derivative of this guy is just zero, and then we just need to take the first derivative of one, two, three, three terms. They are here, one, two, three, three terms. Now let's use Stirling's approximation again. Uh, the first derivative of ln x factorial is roughly this. Uh, the Stirling approximation states that the logarithm of x factorial is approximately x times ln x minus x uh, when x is large. So usually when x is larger than 1000, you can safely use this equation with a very small error. And then we evaluate this uh, derivative. The result is ln x. Therefore, the first derivative of this guy is simply ln 50, 500,000 plus n3. Okay, and similarly, we can uh, get the derivative of this guy and this guy. So we got this equation here. Okay, so this three terms are the uh, first derivatives of these three terms. Uh, by the way, this negative 2 comes from here. Okay, this is the chain rule. And then we can just solve this equation easily, but we can also use Wolfram Alpha to solve this equation for us. Uh, we get two solutions. And three can be uh, 87,000 or 612,996. Uh, but this one is not a legitimate solution because if N3 is this, it's going to result in a negative N2 because N2 is 400,000 minus 2N3. So now we have just one solution, one legitimate solution. N3 is 87,000. N4, and then we have N2, N2 is 400,000 minus 2 and 3, we get this number. And finally, we determine the value of N1, this number. Uh, pay attention here, N1 is larger than N2, N2 is larger than N3. That means more molecules occupy the lower energy level. Uh, just to verify the total energy is correct, so I'm using this number times uh, just 1 epsilon and this number times 2 epsilon, the result is 400,000 epsilon. Now let's look at the ratio of the populations or occupation numbers of the different energy levels. So N2 over N1 is this, 0.38499. N3 over N2 is also 0.38499. So it seems N3 over N2 is exactly the same as N2 over N1. And is this a coincidence? Well, it's not, because the three energy levels are 0, epsilon, and 2 epsilon. So really, the energy difference between N1 and N2 is epsilon. The energy difference between N2 and N3 is also epsilon. So really, this guy is e to the power of negative epsilon over kBT. And this part is supposed to be e to the power of negative epsilon over kVt as well. All right, it's not a coincidence. So really, we have this equation. e to the power of negative epsilon over kVt is that ratio, 0 0.38499. Uh, by taking the natural logarithm of both sides, we get this equation, and we know epsilon is 0 0.95454 kVt for this numerical example. And also, we can just express the temperature in terms of epsilon. Temperature is just epsilon over 0 0.95454 kB. kB is the Boltzmann constant. So if you are given the value of epsilon, you will be able to determine the temperature of this system. Now let's calculate the total number of microstates. It's this 900,000 factorial over N1 factorial, oh, this is N3 factorial, N2 factorial, N1 factorial. The result is this. This is a huge number. So I used Wolfram Alpha to calculate uh, this number of microstates. Now I want to tell you the equation of Boltzmann entropy. Boltzmann proposed a simple equation for 
entropy calculation. Entropy is equal to the Boltzmann constant times the natural logarithm of microstates. So we have the number of microstates here, just plug it in here, and we have the entropy of the system. So this 900,000 particles have an entropy of 766,426 um, KB. This is the entropy of this 900,000 particles. Now there is a way to calculate the total number of microstates for all possible distributions for this 900,000 particles having 400,000 quanta of energy. Uh, this is given by uh, this equation. I'm not going to uh, explain this here. Uh, if you are interested, uh, you can uh, read more books on uh, permutations and combinations. Now let's look at this uh, total number of microstates. It's 10 to the power of 348,000. So over here, 10 to the power of 332,000. So it seems these two numbers differ uh, significantly. So this number uh, divided by this number, you get 10 to the power of uh, 16,000. That's a huge number. However, if you look at the entropy, so the entropy here is uh, calculated using this uh, Boltzmann entropy equation. The result is uh, 800, uh, roughly 800,000 kb. So this entropy is fairly close to this entropy. Uh, the configuration that assumes the Boltzmann distribution among only three energy levels, 0, epsilon, and 2 epsilon, contributes to 95% of uh, the total entropy of the system. All right. So what do I mean by this total entropy of the system? So I'm assuming all other possible energy levels are accessible. So let's say if it's possible for a molecule to have an energy of 3 epsilon, 4 epsilon, or even 400,000 epsilon, then the entropy calculated, assuming the Boltzmann distribution over here, uh, is going to be larger then this number, it's going to be even closer to the exact entropy of the system. So again, when we calculate uh, the total entropy of the system here, we assume that all particles may have uh, 0, epsilon, 2 epsilon, 3 epsilon, 4 epsilon, all the way to 400,000 epsilon energy. And over here in this numerical example, uh, we assumed that there are only three uh, possible energy levels, 0, epsilon, and 2 epsilon. So that means we underestimated the number of microstates uh, by doing this uh, calculation. All right, and this calculation. We underestimated the number of microstates, and thereby we underestimated uh, the entropy. Uh, now, supporting information of this chapter, I want to uh, show you a simple numerical example to illustrate the method of Lagrange multipliers. Uh, let's say the goal is to minimize this function that contains four variables, uh, given this constraint. So first, you need to rewrite this constraint um, in this form. So x plus y plus 2z plus 2u minus 9 is 0. And then we first define a Lagrange function L. So this L is this function to be minimized minus alpha times the constraint. Again, this part is always 0. So minus alpha times 0 is going to be just minus 0. So that means L is equal to uh, this function regardless of the value of alpha. And then to minimize this L, we'll have to uh, take its first derivative with respect to x, y, z, and u. So we got this two, uh, this four equations. And we get x is equal to uh, alpha over 2, y is alpha over 4, z is alpha over 4, u is alpha over 2. And now we have this constraint. Uh, we just plug in 
the expressions of x, y, z, and u in terms of alpha in this constraint equation, we get the value of alpha, alpha is 4. So again, regardless of the value of alpha, this L is equal to W. So when alpha is 4, L is also equal to, uh, well, I shouldn't say W. L is also equal to this function. So when alpha equals 4, L is the function to be minimized. And also we took the constraint into account. Okay, by doing this, we took the constraint into account. And since alpha is 4, we can easily compute x, y, z, and u. x is 2, y is 1, z is 1, u is 2. And then we plug in those values, we get the minimum value of this function. It's just 18. Uh, in summary, if we need to minimize or maximize a function under a constraint, we'll have to propose a Lagrangian to be that function minus a parameter alpha times the constraint. All right, so this is the constraint. And this g constraint is always 0. And then we set the first derivatives of this Lagrange, Lagrangian to be 0. We get that 1, 2, 3, 4, 4 equations. And plus this constraint equation, we have a total of 5 equations. In these five equations, we have five variables, x, y, z, u, and alpha. Therefore, we can solve for those variables and then determine the minimum or maximum value of the function under this constraint.